Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you here today. I wanted to thank uh, the many college students that assisted with the many different things, but especially on uh, Wednesday for the competition. That we, and again, just really couldn't do that without you. Thank you so much. Wanted to thank uh, those that helped with the special music and then uh, those that put all that work into that play. That play was such a blessing. Um, uh, just the, the set was wonderful. The, just, the, uh, just you had your parts down, uh, just the, the scenes. And, and again, as you get older, you can't see as well. Your night vision goes. And so it was, they, they shut out those lights and it was pitch black. And you guys were doing something up there on the stage. And I'm just like, I, how can they see? I see nothing. And they're, uh, they're setting up the next scene and maybe one step away from death at the end of the, uh, which I was very close to death. Uh, I was in the front row and there was Lawrence, you know, with his knife. And, and he went, he attacked and this knife went flying out into the crowd. And I was right there. I thought, what a, what a scene that would have been. The lights come up at the end and there I am, you know. <laughs> We, we thought this was over, but look, that guy's still part of the play. No, no, this is, you know, call an ambulance. Uh, but uh, that, that was, uh, I was looking up t- uh, Tyndale a little bit this morning. He really was a hero. That's a, good, and that's a fun way. You college students that were a part of that, never forget that story. And uh, he really is a, a hero. I um, I looked this up this morning a little bit. Um, in the 1611 King James, uh, the 54 scholars that got together to uh, um, produce that, they drew very significantly from Tyndale's work. One person estimated that 83% of the New Testament they, they, brought, they took right across from Tyndale um, as, as they checked and rechecked and sent things around. Um, they thought, this is, this is good stuff, as they did that. And then 76% of the Old Testament. Um, he, he was uh, highly influenced the English language, too, with some of the phrases that he brought across. Um, anyway, he really is some, someone you want to know something about. And hopefully, uh, that, that's not a name that won't just come and then pass off the scene in your mind, but hopefully that's a name that you'll... Uh, hang on to. All right, uh, so I get to preach today and next Monday. So I have a, a long sermon that I kind of thought, well, I'll, I'll just split that into, uh, into two parts. Um, and I want to talk about the, the I am's of Jesus. Uh, in the book of Romans, I, I came across a listing and it kind of um, drew my attention that the Apostle Paul, somebody said, well, there are... Uh, seven I am's of the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans. And I got to thinking, I said, well, that's interesting. There are seven I am's of, of Jesus in the book of John. And so I uh, got to thinking, well, it would make sense that your I am's would change when you get to know the Lord Jesus. Your I am's change. So, uh, of course, we have another I am in Galatians 2.20 where it says, I am crucified. That's Paul. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And if Christ is living in you, if the great I am is living in you and through you, your I am's will change. And so Paul has some pretty fun I am's in the book of Romans, and we'll look at those next week. But this week, I wanted to look at the I am's of of Christ and bring some of those out and, and enjoy that for a little bit. So the I am's of man. How do the I am's of man change? Of, of course, we have boastful I am's of, of man. Where you, you, this, you think of a boxer that, 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 that beats his opponent and he's laying there and, and he's, he's maybe jumping up and down. He's all sweaty and maybe bloody. And he's like, I'm the greatest. I am the greatest. I, you know, that's, that's one of the I am's of man and we long for that. Um, to be the greatest, the world champion. Um, oh, I, I guess it was a year ago or so. I'm I'm, I'm looking at uh, I'm wa- watching some YouTube videos on on uh, on sports. I like to see, I like to watch sports highlights and 
and they're, they're talking about, well, who's the goat? Who's the goat? And I'm just thinking they, they talk about that like it's a good thing. Um, I just, I mean, I, everyone wants to be the goat, and I'm not sure what the goat is. <laughs> I'm like, who's the goat? And I'm like, what does that mean? And why do they want to be the goat? Uh, and, and so I, I did some research and found out that that G-O-A-T, who's the greatest of all time. So it comes up that the discussion of, is it Lionel Messi? Is it Cristiano Ronaldo with soccer? Who's the goat? Who's the greatest of all time? And I'm like, well, that's not even fair. I mean, what if in a decade from now, someone comes that blows them out of the water? You know, who can say of all time when you don't know all time yet? Um, and LeBron James or Michael Jordan, who's the goat? And so people, uh, IMs are kind of uh, boastful sometimes. Sometimes IMs are, are just indicative. Um, you know, Mr. somebody said, well, who's the dean of Bible? And brother, Pastor Armour said, I'm the dean of Bible. Or who's the dean of students? We have a problem. It's like, I'm the dean of students. <laughs> I am the dean of... Sometimes it's just an indicative uh, uh, statement of, I am this or that. You know, my, my wife might come in and, 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 and walk in the, the living room. She's got her shoes on. She's walking right on the carpet. We're like, Mom, you know the house rules. There you are walking. And, she, and she'll say, I am the mom. I am the mom. Okay, you're like, yeah, enough said. Enough said. Um, and sometimes it, uh, the I am's are helpful. Sometimes it's just a matter of uh, I am the customer service rep. If you need something, I am the person to come to. Kind of like, we have a problem. Who's the, who's the dean of students? It's like, I am, you know. So that's the, that's the person. So, so I am's, there's different kinds of, of I am's. Um, now, Jesus, as, as you discuss the I am's of Jesus, um, uh, most people talk about how uh, these I am's are an expression of his deity. The I am's, uh, of course, uh, language fails us in expressing how magnificent and how glorious the Lord Jesus is. As he says, I am, I am, I am, what could he put there? Uh, but it's interesting what he chose to put there. Uh, each of these seven I am statements uh, shows, um, yes, his deity, but his helpfulness at the same time. Not just, I am this, envy me. I am this, you know, uh, look up to me. But I am this, receive help from me. The I am's, each one, I am, and what could he put there? And each one of these, he put something there that says, um, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. Not just I am this, a ball before me. I am this, envy me. I am this. No, you can never be like me. And, or the, like the goat, greatest of all time, you know, emulate me. No, that's, that's not the purpose of goat. It's I, I'm the best and nobody can approach. I mean, I, I'm just the greatest of all time. So he is the, he is the great I am. Of course, way back in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, uh, it talked about um, uh, Moses was saying, I, I'm going to uh, go before Pharaoh, I'm going to go before the elders of Israel, and, uh, and he's asking God, I don't think I'm capable, I don't think I'm this, and, and at one point God said, tell him the I am hath sent you. And that's very much linked to the Lord Jesus Christ, um, but he says the I am, the, the self-existent one. And again, we talk about if my air dries up, I die. If my food and water supply dries up, I do too. If my sunshine, you know, if it stops, I'm gone. I'm very much a needy creature. <laughs> and the Lord Jesus is not, is not. God is not needy. He's self-existence. There was nothing there, and he spoke and things came to be. Those, th those things that came to be uh, sustain my life. I am not self-existent at all. He is. And of course, that meant that he is uh, outside of time. Um, before Abraham was, he, he actually says in John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. Now, this is an interesting thought. You and I are, we entered time and we progressed through time. Jesus actually stepped into time from eternity. 
It's an interesting thought. He was not within time. He was outside of time watching us move through time. And then he stepped into time when the fullness of time had come. So he who was in eternity stepped into time to move through time with us to lay out some examples for our steps and then to die on our behalf. He's the great I am. And we want the great I am to be within us and change our I am's. Because we should have some I am's. And so let's go through some of those before my time is gone. All right, let's go to John 6.30. John chapter 6, verse 30. John chapter 6, verse 30. We have the first I am. And again, um, uh, it's not, he's not talking about uh, uh, just his position. He's telling us things that he can be for us and that we ought to take advantage of. So here in John, John chapter 6, verse 30, um, they said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What, uh, what dost thou work? Of course, what sign? And of course, there's that arrogancy. What sign showest thou? What sign do you have? And of course, he had fed uh, upwards of maybe 20,000 people with, a, with the, the lunch of a little boy. And then that, again, we human beings act like we're, we're, that, we're all that because we're hard to impress. And it's just, it's just, it's not the fact that we're just, I'm all that, I'm hard to impress. It's just we're arrogant. That's all there is to it. So here he fed, he fed 20,000 people and they're like, uh, hey, but you're no Moses, okay? Don't even begin to think that you're like Moses. He fed uh, a whole nation in the wilderness for 40 years, and his, his uh, supply didn't come from the, the lunch of a little boy. His supply came from heaven. So, yeah, it's semi-impressive that you took a lunch and fed 20,000 people. But, uh, you know, you're, you're no Moses. I mean, don't get a big head or anything. What work showest thou? Um, our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, we gave, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Um, for the bread of God is he that cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. They said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. So that reminds us of the woman at the well when Jesus began talking about the water that she needed. And, and there in, in John 4, just a couple chapters earlier in verse 15, she says, give me this water. I want this water. And, and Jesus, of course, says, you're looking at him. I am what you need. And of course, so here, they're like, give us this bread. And, and then he makes this statement in verse 35. I am the bread of life. Um, that's an exciting statement. Now, I, I started, Pastor Arbor, I started looking. I'm like, somebody has an alliterated listing of the I am's of Jesus, and I'm going to find it. So we had some company over last night. It was really good, and the fellowship was wonderful, so they didn't leave till like 1030. And so uh, I'm thinking, I'm going to find this list. And so I, I went on Sermon Audio, and, I, and I, I had no luck finding an alliterated listing of the I am's of Jesus. And so I, I just I plugged it into uh, an explorer, uh, 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 I am's of Jesus, and, and started looking into uh, the internet, just seeing if somebody, and I, I had zero luck, not even a bad outline that I'm like, eh, you know, zero luck. Then I went to YouTube and just plugged in the I am statements of Jesus, and there's a lot of YouTube videos, zero, nobody, and again, I'm sure it's out there. And you guys probably are like, I just got that this morning in my, in my lectures. I could give it to you. You need it? Sure. No. I, so I, I'll look at it later. But so I thought, I, I'm like, Lord, I, I'd really like to kind of work on an alliterated listing to kind of lay it out and, and make this a little more memorable for, for the students and for myself. And so um, this first one where he says, I am the bread. And he says here in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh unto me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. Sounds completely satisfying, doesn't it? Sounds completely satisfying. So the first one I put down, he's the source of satisfaction. 
By the way, he doesn't just want to be one of my avenues of satisfaction. He wants to be the one and only source of all true satisfaction. If you say, well, there's other things satisfies, you want to ask yourself, is it an extension of the satisfaction of God or not? If it's, he is the source of all true satisfaction. And anything you find that doesn't flow from him is a counterfeit source of satisfaction. And you say, well, why should he care? Well, let me put it to you this way. What if, what if I'm like, if I tell my wife, again, this illustration I use it a lot, hun, you're a great source of satisfaction to me. There's other girls out there that are also uh, potential sources of satisfaction to me. So um, be warmed, you know, enjoy the thought that you're one of the sources of satisfaction for me as I, you know, take this other girl out to dinner. Um, that, you know, I, she would meet me with a baseball bat. <laughs> And so he really is not just uh, um, a source of satisfaction, but he needs to be the only source of satisfaction. And you need to ask yourself, what satisfies me? Is it counterfeit? Does it, does it flow from him? A cheeseburger, all right? I think God enjoys watching me enjoy a cheeseburger. You know, uh, th that types of things. And again, that's, that's, we're going to sit down to Thanksgiving dinner. And, that's, and we're going we're gonna to praise God for his, his goodness. Uh, count your many blessings, name them by the score, and it will surprise you. There are hundreds more. Uh, the, the blessings that are going to flow from God to us. So, and again, how many of you have ever sat before like a, an, a, an amazing spread of food and somebody, uh, somebody declares, if you go away hungry, if somebody said it, it's your own fault, right? So Jesus, he says, if, again, if you're not, if you're like, I'm just not satisfied today. Jesus came to be the ultimate source of satisfaction. And, and he says, I am. Well, that's good. I'm glad for you. What did he say, though? I am your source of satisfaction. That's what he, with his ultimate power and, and, and his magnificence, he says, I am your source of satisfaction. Again, that, that's, that's marvelous to me. He's the source of all satisfaction. The table is set. And if you go away hungry, it's your own fault. Okay, let's, let's jump next to chapter 8. At the beginning of chapter 8, they bring a woman before Jesus. And they're like, uh, Master, this woman was taken in adultery. Um, and, and then he begins writing in the sand, and then he says, He that is without sin, verse 7, among you let him cast a stone, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Um, and they that heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out every one of them, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted himself up and saw none but the woman, he said, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No, Lord. And Jesus said unto them, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So light. And this is uh, the, it's the first thing that, Je that God created, that Jesus created. Um, at the very beginning in, in Genesis 1, 3, let there be light. Light pierced the darkness. Uh, God is light. Uh, uh, 1 John 1, 5, at the end of that verse, it says, God is light, and in him is there no darkness at all. One of the quotes I read was, uh, Jesus is to the heart what the sun is to this earth. And what is the sun to this earth? Mm, most everything? If the sun, will the earth, let me ask, will the earth cease to exist if the sun is not out there? No. I mean, the earth will be here. But it will be dead and cold and lifeless. And a heart without the warmth of the Lord Jesus Christ there is cold and dead and lifeless. And Christ offers to shine into that heart and into that life and bring, uh, that, and bring warmth there and life. So that, that light. So this earth, 
Um, you think, there's life on this earth. How is there life on this earth? The sun brings warmth. There's water. And everything that brings life to this earth, you can link, it's, it's a picture of the Lord Jesus or, or God. Uh, the, the water that's here, uh, the, 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 the air that's here is an illustration of the Holy Spirit. The wind bloweth where it listeth. And uh, there in John chapter 3, everything that brings life, and of course the, the original uh, miraculous giving of life at the very beginning. Just, just a, um, uh, life doesn't exist here because of the water and the warmth and the air. Life is sustained by those things, and they were, it was miraculously given in the first place. Okay? And so God can miraculously give life to a cold, dead heart, and he can sustain that life by, by the light that he is. I am the light of this world. How many of you, when you're driving along, you're, you're, you're looking for undercover police cars? And one of the things that, that, that kind of causes a car to stand out is, is that extra spotlight over there by, the, <laughs> by the, one of the uh, side uh, view mirrors. And you're like, oh, what's he got that for? Um, and that spotlight is either hurtful or helpful, depending on where you are in relation to that sp spotlight. If you're in the car... It's probably nice to have a spotlight to, as, you're, as you're driving and shining on things. If you're out there up to no good, and that, shot, that, that light shines on your face, you're like, oh, you know, get rid of the light. You know, it's irritating me. And so, um, but again, the, the light is going to shine, and where you are in relation to that light, it's going to irritate you or be a blessing to you. So instead of getting mad at the light, go over next to it and let it be a help to you. As the, as the policeman has, the, 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 the flashlights are so bright nowadays, aren't they? And they can strobe and disorient and they can shine it in your face. You're like, stop, you know? Um, but if you're, if you're next to the policeman holding that light, shining it out there, you're like, <laughs> look what that light's doing to those people. Um, and so if, if the light of God is irritating, go, go get it next to him and let it be a blessing and a help to you. All right, so number one, he's the source of satisfaction. Number two... He's the sunshine for my soul. And I went ahead and misspelled it. S-O-N. He's the sunshine for my soul. Let's go now to, of course, we have John chapter 9 in between here, where it's the man born blind, and we know that he gives physical sight as well as spiritual sight. But we jump ahead to John chapter 10. In verse 9, here he's talking about the, he's the good shepherd. Uh, here in verse 9, uh, well, let's back up to verse 7. John 10, verse 7, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. And then, oh, Let me just go ahead and keep reading. Uh, uh, I am the door of the sheep. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So we see that salvation is uh, through the door. Security is because of the door. And sufficiency is behind the door. It's a very special door. Of course, we know that, that uh, there would be an opening in a, in a, in a gate, in a, in a, in a, I'm sorry, in a fence, and the shepherd would lie across the opening of that gate. And, and uh, uh, vicious animals... Uh, wouldn't be able to get in through the gate because they'd have to go through him. A, a sleepwalking sheep can't get out at nighttime. You know, if that, that sheep couldn't get to sleep, and so it was counting sheep and hopping over something, and it finally fell asleep, but it was sleepwalking. It was one of those sheep, and it was like going over and trips on the shepherd. He's able to, you know, push it back or whatever. Um, so we enjoy this. We heard a message on this yesterday morning. Pastor Dameron preached about the, the armor of God, and then he talked about the helmet of salvation that's so important to protect the mind from doubt. Pastor Barrera, uh, and that's, it's from this chapter here, talked about the fact that the, the saint is in the hand of, of, of the Lord Jesus, and then he's also in the hand of the Father. And then you say, well, there, I see some cracks there. And he said, well, the Holy Spirit takes care of those as he seals every one of the cracks around there. And we have a, we have a three-part security. And so he's the source of all satisfaction. He's the sunshine for my soul. And he's the security for the saint. He's the security for the saint. I am 
the door. He's the salvation, the security, and the sufficiency. This chapter also contains another one. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. So this was the toughest of all. I, I had the hardest time coming up with two S's. I'm like, well, S is for shepherd of the sheep. S is for shepherd. Like, well, there it is. I'm just kidding. Um, there it is. All right, so he's the shepherd of the sheep. Um, he's, the, he's the heavenly shepherd. He lays down his life for the sheep. And I, I just thought about this, and I praised God for our pastor. Um, he, it, he gets a paycheck for doing what he does, but it's not a, he's not a hireling under shepherd. He's here because he's, he, he has chosen to pour his life into letting God use him to be a help to people. And, uh, and you know why? Because his I am, as he says, I am the pastor of this church, it's different. It's different than, it's not a position for him, um, although it is a position, but it's like I'm the pastor of this church. I'm here if you need me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch. He takes his job seriously. I'm going to watch for the wolves to come into this church. I'm going to watch. I'm going to take this job seriously. And when you're close to the Lord Jesus, it's, it's not just a job. We see there's the heavenly shepherd, but then we see there's a hireling shepherd here in verse 12. Um, but he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own, sheep, um, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep. So we see the hireling lacks commitment. Commitment. Danger comes and he takes off. He's like, why are you here? Why are you here? Danger comes and you leave. <laughs> That's the reason you're here. Oh, it's just, you lack commitment. And then in verse 13, the hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not. So he lacks commitment and he lacks concern. He careth not. And then in verse 14, it says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and am known of mine. Um, this hireling lacks comprehension. Lacks comprehension. He's like, they're not my sheep. I don't know them. They don't know me. I get out of here. But aren't you glad we have a heavenly shepherd? A heavenly shepherd. The I am's. He's the source of satisfaction. The sunshine for my soul. The security for the saints. The shepherd of the sheep. One chapter later, we have chapter 11. Pastor Carpenter preached out of chapter 11 a while ago. Uh, about the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And what a, what a good message. And let me remind you, you can go back and review those messages. They're right there on, on, on Fairhaven uh, Media. Um, it's, it's good to be able to go back. And people don't have to buy CDs anymore, do they? Or, or preaching tapes. We used to buy a preaching tape. It's like, I, that was heart stirring. I got to have, you know, Pastor Armacost and, and, and myself. Back in the day, you just had to, it's like, do I want to lay down the cold, hard cash to, to have that in the form of a cassette tape for me to pop into my tape deck and listen to again? Well, you guys, you just, you just have it all being recorded for you and, and, and in front of you. And so um, hopefully you remember to go back periodically and, and, or, or jot yourself a note. That's, I need that. Or maybe even put it in Google Calendar. I need to hear that once a year. And, and put it in your liked videos or something so it's right there. You don't have to search too far, and, and have your Google Calendar say, listen to that, you need it. You need it. Um, but here, in John chapter 11, Lazarus had died. And of course, the question comes up, why did Lazarus die? Well, because of sin. We know in, in Romans 5.12, uh, we know why people die. Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And so sin brings death. And when sin comes for you, when death comes for you, there's nothing you can do. But death had come for Lazarus, and there was nothing he could do. But I'm excited that there was something that Jesus could do. Because sin doesn't get to do whatever it wants. Death doesn't get to do whatever it wants when Jesus is around. Lazarus had died, and Jesus said no. I'm bringing him back because he's the sovereign over sin. He's the sovereign over sin. And I like Tony's testimony yesterday when he said, I kind of think that Jesus in the boat during the storm kind of just said, Storm, shut up. 
He said, peace be still. And of course, we know the devil is the prince of the power of the air. And there's a very good chance in my, in my understanding that the devil could have said, oh, there's Jesus. Let me send a storm. Maybe I can drown the Son of God. And Jesus said, a storm, enough. Peace be still. And it was done. So there's Jesus. And it says, he groaned when he saw the tears he groaned and he even wept himself. You know, our, our favorite of all memory verses, right? John eleven thirty five. 35. He groaned himself and he realized, he, I don't like seeing what death does to people. It hurts people. And I didn't set things up this way. I don't like seeing what death does and the hurt that it causes. And they said, oh, behold how much he loved him. They, they, they observed his feelings, and then they thought they observed his frailties when, he said, uh, when they said, oh, could not this one that performed so many other miracles have maybe gotten here on time and healed him? But of course, Jesus is always there on time. And he walked up to the stone, and again, I, I kind of think like Tony, it's like, really? You're looking at the stone, you're going to try to stand between me and what I want? I could just, you know. But, but, he, but again, on either side of the raising of Lazarus, he had the people do what they could do. Roll the stone away. Oh, but, 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 roll the stone away. At the end, he comes out. Uh, loose him of those grave clothes. The people could do those things, but there was nothing they could do about death, but he could. Lazarus, come forth. Boy, his... His deity was so on display in this chapter, wasn't it? We also think of that when, when the disciples there, when he re rebuked the storm, and they're like, huh. what a, what a, you just yell at storms? They listen to you? And here he just, he just says, oh, death, I am the sovereign. Sin, can, sin doesn't get to do what it wants when I'm around. I'm the great reverser. I'm the great reverser. On the day of, of greatest darkness, when, when mankind, the, the evil and venom of all mankind came and, 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 and put me to death, I transformed that day of greatest darkness into the, gray of, the day of greatest light. The day when we look and, and we, we, we glory in that cross. He's the great reverser. He's the sovereign over sin. All right, and then we go to John 14.6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so here, uh, he, is the, he is the surety for our salvation. Um, uh, the, 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 the great question is, how, how can I be ready for the afterlife? How, how can I be settled in this life? How can I be satisfied in this life? And we know that probably if you want to figure out how to get to heaven, it'd be good to, if you could ask somebody that's from there. Right? Um, I, if, if you're food a thoning, right? And I've got, I've got someone in my car and they're like, oh, yeah, the roses. I had the roses with me the other day. And they're like, uh, um, I'm like, I'm going to take you guys home. I don't remember how to get there. Well, the best person to ask how to get, well, sometimes, right? But they happen to know. They happened to know where they lived. Um, and so you're like, how can I get to heaven? Oh, I'm, I'm from there. I can tell you. I'm from there. And in fact, I, I won't just show you the way. I happen to be the way. He's the shorty for our salvation. And then uh, and I am the way, the truth. All right? Uh, how can I be settled in this life? He's the truth. Error is so accommodating. You know, 2 plus 2, can it be 10? Why not? Can it be 11? Sure. So we think accommodating equals good, but error is so accommodating. Error is so broad. Um, the truth is 2 plus 2 is 4. Truth is narrow. But when you have something that you can, that you can have a foundation for your life, and that is he is the truth. He, it's, it's, a, it's a narrow way, but it's a good way. When you have error that's broad and accommodating, you have nothing. And how can I be satisfied? Again, he's the way, the truth, and he's the life. He's the reason for getting up in the morning. 
He's the reason for going through the day. He's everything. Then we go over to John chapter 15, the last one here. Um, and it says, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Uh, here, I am the true vine. Um, so we are the branches and we need to be plugged into the vine. Uh, there's a lot in Scripture about the vine with, with Israel. And then, and then here, he's, he's, he's addressing the, his, 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 his followers, the, the church, um, uh, the, the disciples. And it was important that they needed to be plugged in to the vine. A branch cannot do anything unless it's plugged in to a vine. I think back to what Pastor uh, Kroll, how he concluded his Thursday night sermon there with Joseph in Genesis 49.22. In Genesis 49, uh, it says this, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over a wall. Now, I told you the story before, but I grew up in Utah. My next door neighbor had a peach tree, and that peach tree, there were big branches that leaned over into our yard, and he said, take any, as many peaches as you want. So, there, was a, there, were there were underground water supplies that that tree could tap into. And I can't tap into the underground water supplies that the peach tree tapped into, but the tree did me a huge favor because it tapped into resources that I could not and transformed them into a peach. It was so nice of that. And, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and the branches leaned over my wall and went into my yard. And I could take that peach because of resources that I could not tap into, but it was tapped into those resources. It brought me a peach. How nice of that tree. And I would take that peach and eat it. Joseph was tapped in. It was a fruitful bough by a well. A well, underground water supplies. And again, you see Joseph in the, in the prison. You say, Joseph, well, how can you be so upbeat? You're in jail. It's almost like you're tapped into resources that I cannot see. There he is a, a chained and going off to, to become a, a, a slave in Egypt. Joseph, why do you keep acting like God is everything to you? And there, there were the two, uh, the butler and the baker. There was all these people that said, what is this? His, his life was a fruitful life. He was tapped into. And, his, and the branches reached over a wall, didn't they? People that, that maybe should not have known him because of God uh, taking him here and taking him there and, and his branches that reached outside of his family into Egypt. And then the world flowed to Egypt. Blessings flowed to, to Egypt because of the fruitfulness of his life and what he could be because he was tapped into a resource they couldn't have access to. Jesus is the true vine. And you and I must be tapped in. Because if we're going to give that fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, the fruit that flowed from the Lord Jesus Christ, there in John chapter 4, that woman, she enjoyed the fruit of the Spirit that was evident in Christ's life, and it led to her conversion, fruit that was born on the branch, and then fruit that... That, that came as a result of another, another person being saved. Well, you get, get a, pe a peach, right? There, there's fruit there that comes on the branch. But when, that, but when that seed comes down and there's brand new life, there's a couple results of, of being plugged in, isn't there? There's the fruit that that branch bears. And then when the seeds are dropped, there's another peach tree there. There's reproduction. But we have to be plugged in. The last one. He's the sustainer of my spirituality. He's the spring of my spirituality. He's the stock of my spirituality. So the table is set. The I am's of Christ. He laid out all the things that He wants to be for you. Well, sometimes I, the I am's of humanity are I am this. <laughs> Envy me. <laughs> I am this. I am this, but when Christ laid out the I am's of who he was, each one of them, he says, these are different ways that the same person
can be a help to you and a blessing to you. When we take advantage of those I am's, and we can, we can say another I am, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. He will change our I am's. And next Monday, I want to look at some of the I am's that should come as a result of the I am living through us. If you want to try to jot these down, you can, you can look at them before we get there. Uh, Romans 1, 14, 15, and 16 are the first three. Romans 7, 14, 8, 38, 15, 29, and 16, 19. We'll look at those uh, next week. So the table is set. Everything you need is on it. If you walk away and say, I'm hungry, it's your own fault. He's everything you need. And He's a very present help in time of trouble, time of need. So if you're not satisfied today, it's not His fault. The great I Am is very available. I just wanted to lift Him up today and uh, remind us of how important, how precious He is to us. The sunshine of my soul.